Good evening, good evening, good evening. I, I want to make a few announcements before we get started this evening. We have a new baby in the church. I think I might need a little bit more volume out there. Can you hear me now? I can hear me now. <laughs> we have a new baby in the church. Amen. Sister Carson had her baby. That's a reason to celebrate. In fact, uh, I heard a quote the other day, and I thought it was um, it was kind of convicting. It said that if there are no babies in your church, you're just a few funerals away from closing the doors. So we have a new baby in the church. But with that being said, um, there is a sign-up sheet outside for anybody that would be interested in helping with a meal. Uh, bring your best, do your best, like I know you can, and let's feed mama and baby, shall we? Uh, also, I want to remind you that we have Family and Friends Sunday coming up this coming Sunday. So if you have drinks, bring them. Make sure they're Christian drinks. You know what I mean. <laughs> Leave the new wine to them, to others, not us. That being said, um, again, we have a lot of interesting things coming up. And uh, by way of request, <coughs> I have a few uh, prayer requests that the Lord knows all about, and he's keenly aware of them. But I'm curious, do you have a prayer request this evening, whether just by the uplifted hand or if you want to make it known, by all means make it known. Amen. <coughs> Would you stand with me and let's go to prayer this evening? I'm going to ask Pastor Denny if he would to lead us in prayer this evening. Amen. If you would remain standing. I'm sure we know this one. If you don't, learn it with me tonight. But help me sing it. Singing. 
Jesus. What a lovely name, the name of Jesus. Such a lovely name, reaching higher far than the brightest star. They sing in heaven, let the world proclaim, what a lovely name. Aren't you thankful for such a wonderful name this evening? Can you sing that chorus with me just one more time? Can I just tell you this before we go any further? I enjoy doing this. I enjoy singing. I enjoy playing. I enjoy singing to you. But more importantly, I enjoy worshiping. And by the way, I'm preaching tonight, so I, I think I have a little bit of liberty to do this. But you know, there used to be a time that it wasn't just singing, but it was congregation of singing. That implies you. So could you help me tonight as a congregation? Not just to sing, but can you lift up a thanksgiving praise? Because the book of Acts says that there is no other name given under heaven by which men should be saved than that at the name of Jesus. Can you sing that with me? What a lovely name. Reaching higher. Give yourselves a hand this evening. You may be seated for a moment. There's another song we used to sing. It says, there is a name I love to hear. I love to do what? Sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ears. The sweetest name on earth. I find it interesting that um, if you're ever asked to pray corporately for the state house or for even a government, uh, like a local government meeting, they'll tell you that you can pray but you're not allowed to end your prayer in the name of Jesus. I mean, that, that, that's the day and age we live in. They'll say that you can say in the name of God. Well, that's kind of vague, isn't it? We, we know God to be God Jehovah. But last time I checked, Jesus himself said, if you ask anything in my name, it shall be done. So I'll say it again, what a lovely name, the name of Jesus. Reaching higher far than the brightest star, and it's sweeter. Did you catch that? It's sweeter than the songs they're singing in heaven. But then he brings it right back, right back down to earth. So let the world proclaim, what a lovely name. Amen. Amen. You'll pardon me if I come across a little distracted this evening, if it wasn't evident during the music. Um, I'm nervous because I'm having to use these tonight. And <laughs> more importantly, I'm nervous tonight and a little distracted because of the word that I have for you. Now, don't, don't, don't get too scared on me. Don't, don't get bashful. <clears throat> I can't make any promises about uh, preaching. But I, I want to I teach you something tonight. And you may already know it, and if you know it already, by all means, feel free to just shout amen and jump in and help. But before we get into the scripture tonight, I want to ask you a question. And this isn't a question for you to think about. This is a question I want you to respond to. So, by all means. When I say the name Goldilocks, 
what comes to mind? The three bears, right? <clears throat> the quick rundown of Goldilocks, if you don't know it. You know, she, she got into the house. She should have been there to begin with, just saying. <laughs> and you know, it, the, the nursery rhyme tells us that it was a, a house in the, cottage, in, in the country, almost a cottage, right? And that she came in and she found porridge, right? Just bear with me, bear with me. First porridge was what? Too hot. The second one was what? Too cold. But the last one was just right. Wow. You, you know your nursery rhymes. Now let me ask you another question. <clears throat> Whenever I say Goldilocks, the person of Goldilocks, what comes to mind? Say it again. A blonde-headed little girl, right? So this blonde-headed little girl is in a house with, that's obviously not hers. And not only is she in a house that's obviously not hers, but she's eating food that's obviously not hers. She's sitting in chairs that are not hers and sleeping in beds that are not hers. And then we know the story. The three bears come home. Somebody's been eating my porridge. You know, I grew up old school, and I always thought that was peculiar because why would they leave food out on the table? <laughs> <clears throat> and somebody's been sitting in my chair, some, and somebody's in my bed, and there's somebody laid in my bed, and then little baby bear says, they're in my bed. And, you know, Goldilocks takes off and runs away, right? End of story. Cute, isn't it? Did you know that the story that we were told of Goldilocks is actually the fourth rewrite of the story? Bear with me here. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but Goldilocks in the first tale was a woman in her 80s. Her hair was gray. She lived in the city. I love you, sister. <laughs> she lived in the city. Her neighbors were bears, but they were rich. She was poor. And the thing is, is that she watched for the bears to go away, Sister Cindy. And when she noticed that the bears had gone away, she broke into the house. Tried the porridge. Tried to get comfortable. And guess what happened? When the bears came home and found her, they tried to drown her. I got one phrase for you. Castle law. <laughs> if you know, you know. They tried to beat her and bludgeon her. And whenever that didn't work, guess what they did? They impaled her on the steeple of a church, killing her. I don't know anybody that has neighbors that are bears. <laughs> oh, no. <clears throat> but the thing is this. If you notice that the story we're told couldn't be further from the truth of the first writing, right? Now, what in the world does this have to do with Scripture? Let me ask you a question. And just think about this one. Why is it that original stories have to be edited and monitored? They change. How's about this? That's a good point. Because the message that they convey is just too harsh. Now, Here's, here's where I make my point tonight, and we're getting into the Word. When we talk about the Christian life, I'm afraid that we have at times fallen for something that has robbed us of the truth. For instance, <clears throat> the song we sang tonight, the second verse, He'll return in clouds of glory, right? 
I believe that. I believe he will. But the thing is, is that think about it. (laughs) Sweetheart, I'm so glad you're over there. Please pray for me. And happy birthday, by the way. The thing is this. At the end of the day, whenever it comes to being saved, when it comes to being a believer in Jesus, one of the greatest ways that the enemy has convinced us to remain stale and stagnant because the devil cannot touch your salvation because it's not his. He's not the author of salvation. God is. If, because he can't touch your salvation, he attempts to immobilize you so that you can't do any of it. He keeps you stagnant and stale. And do you know how he keeps you stagnant and stale? He keeps your eye off the present and makes you future focused only. And again, just bear with me. I, I, ha- I have to obey the Lord tonight. Because I want to give you hope. The beautiful thing is that I remember growing up and <clears throat> popcorn testimonies in church. And they almost all started the same. I thank God I'm saved, sanctified, baptized in heaven, sweet Holy Ghost, and on my way to heaven. There's a lot that can happen between being baptized in heaven, sweet Holy Ghost, and getting to heaven. How many times have we become so convinced of heaven that we miss what God has for us now? I can already tell this isn't going to be popular. I'm on the right track. So the question is, what do we do about that? Because there is something to be done about that. In fact, humans by themselves, by default are notorious for avoiding hard times. Brother Wayne, you're doing so good. Keep on with it. We are notorious for avoiding hard times. We are known to take the path of least resistance. If you don't believe me, There was a time whenever there was no such thing as gas log fire, right? It was just log fire. It's a lot easier just to hook up a line, refill a tank, and turn it on, right? But you see, and again, nothing wrong with that. It's just at times we become so so convinced that the path of least resistance is the best path for us, that we miss a skill in the process. I say that simply as an example my boys this summer, for the first week of summer, they, they sat almost in depression. Because I told them, I said, if you think you're going to sit around all summer and do nothing, you are sadly mistaken. Aww. I said, we are going to learn to read an analog clock. We're going to learn to write cursive. And we're going to spend the rest of your summer on one skill that you choose. They just... And the, thing, and the reason I say that is this, is because there comes a time when you have to do the hard things. And you must endure the hard things in order, everybody good? In order to gain an understanding and an appreciation for those that went before us. Listen what 2 Timothy chapter 2 says. And I'm reading out of King James tonight. 2 Timothy 2 and 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein or because of this, I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Did you check that? Did you get that? He said, because of Jesus Christ and the gospel that I'm preaching, I am treated as a common criminal, wherein I suffer as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But are you ready for this? But the word of God is not bound. Did you catch that? 
He says, I'm in chains for what I'm doing. And I'm suffering for the good news. By the way, he's not complaining. But here's what he does. Instead of rolling around in the mully grub, so to speak, of the hard times he's in, he is focused on the present. And that present moment being, but the word of God is not bound. He says, therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. Did you catch that? He's keenly aware of his task in the present moment. Not just enduring hardship, but enduring hardship for a reason. Because he knows that there are those that he himself has been placed in charge. that Given to him by God. And sometimes in order to go forth and do what God has called you to do, you have to endure hard times. Y'all just hang tight. He says, it is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Who does that sound like? That sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus said that if you, if you attempt to save your life, in the end you will lose it. But if you give your life freely for my account and for my sake, in the end you shall gain it. You see, one of the biggest issues that I'm running into today as a, as a counselor in training, so to speak, specifically when it comes to Christians, Christians my age, is that they want to do the call and the will of God on their life and other. I asked one the other day, I said, why is it that you can't just do what God has called you to do? And you know what their response to me was? And it almost, it, it, well, it made me do a double take. Like, you, you really just said that. He said, I don't want to waste my life just doing one thing. I said, why? He says, I'm 25 and I'm getting old. I said, oh, shut up. <laughs> but sh check this out. Stop for a moment and think about that. In his mind, the only thing that he could see was the finish line. But he couldn't see the race in between the start and the finish. See, the thing is, if you ever watch an athlete, because by the way, Paul uses a lot of these terminologies here. If you ever see an athlete training for something, they're not training for the finish line. They're training to endure until they get to the finish line. Some of you that have been serving the Lord longer than I've been alive, just nod your head if it's the truth of what I'm about to say here. Has it always been easy? Let me ask you a question. Did he ever say it would be easy? Oh, no. In fact, completely contrary to what is being taught by so many of my colleagues today. The prosperity gospel hasn't gone anywhere. It hasn't gone anywhere. People in my age range are teaching that if you're saved... It's going to be easy because Jesus is with you. Last time I checked, my goodness, Lord help me. Do you remember what Jesus told Peter and the rest of his disciples before he ascended? Yes, go into all the world, preach and teach the gospel, make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Yes, he said that. But if, you, <laughs> if you're not careful, you'll miss something. He also told them what was waiting for them as they went and preached. He, the Bible says that he told each and every one of them how they would die for him. Now some of us, we would hit the stop button right then and right there and say, uh-uh, I didn't sign up to die. <laughs> but the thing is, they kept going anyway. They couldn't abandon the gospel anyway. Why? Because they realized, and even they themselves said it in the scriptures, 
They themselves realized that this present suffering is only but for a moment. Oh, I wish I had somebody to help me tonight. (laughs) That this present suffering and this present time is only but for a moment. And Paul understood this because if you keep reading through 2 Timothy, he understood that the finish line would have been worth nothing if the journey in between had not been taken. Think about it. He tells about the people that turned their back on him. He tells about the people that abandoned him. Christians who abandoned him. Christians who backslid. Yes, I still believe backsliding is still possible. The fact of the matter is, is that he talks about his hardship. And he talks about the suffering that he endured. But you see, Sister Cindy, if he had not walked the journey, the crown of righteousness would have been nothing for him. He says, there is none that stands with me. No, not one. This one has forsaken me for the love of the world. This one has turned their back on me. He says, but I'm not worried because now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Hallelujah. A crown of righteousness and the same for you should you endure unto the end. He says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will do what? Deny us. Can I tell you this? I would rather be reprimanded by Jesus any day than anybody else. But there's one thing I cannot live with, being denied by Him. He said that if you do these things, He said just because you say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, you know, we, we've cast out devils in Your name, we've healed the sick in Your name, we've raised the dead in Your name, and He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. Brother Perry, it it terrifies this young preacher to know that there is a possibility that if I don't stand for truth, I will be denied one day. And And if I'm denied, guess what I'm denied? Heaven, at that point, heaven will be the least of my concern and the least of my worry. Denied the streets of gold? Well, I didn't get saved for streets of gold. I didn't, I didn't get saved to have a mansion over the hilltop. Mm-mm. I got saved because I knew I was a sinner. And I knew I needed a Savior. And He promised me that if I endured to the end, I would see His face. To be denied by the face of Jesus, that should shake any believer to the core. He says that we should also be denied. But here's the deal. Then he gives us a little bit of instruction. Are you ready for this? He says, and of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord. That they strive not about words to profit, but to subvert, but the subverting of their hearts. Hang tight. Study to show thyself approved unto who? God. A workman that need not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? I find find it interesting, but then again, I'm, I'm a little weird. I find it interesting that Paul goes out of his way to make the connection that even though I'm in chains, the word of God is not chained. That even though I will be executed, because he was keenly aware that his head was about to roll, and I'm not using figurative language, I'm being very literal. He was keenly aware of what was waiting for him. But then he turns around and compares it to the matchless word of God. He says, but the word of God is not bound So then he tells Timothy to go back to the Word of God. Do you hear me? Go back to the Word of God. Don't just read it. He says, study to show yourselves approved unto who? Man? No. Unto Caesar? No. Study to show yourselves approved unto God. 
Why? Because last time I checked, my Bible tells me that all Scripture is God breathed. That it was exhaled from the nostrils of God onto the pages of holy text, moved upon by holy men, and given so that we could stand in the truth. This same God-breathed word that they said in the Old Testament was a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This God-breathed word came first before anything ever did. Before the first star was ever formed, the word of God was already at work. Study to show yourselves approved unto God. You see... Because he's reminding them that the opinions of man are nothing. Now listen, it's easy for me to stand behind a microphone with a bunch of amens and say, you know, well that's easy for you to say, can can I just be honest with you? Well, I'm going to do it anyway. The fact of the matter is, just yesterday, just yesterday, I had a personal close friend of mine lay some very harsh opinions that others hold about me and just said, I thought you need to know. And you know what? I whelped up a little bit. It left a mark. And it was regarding the call of God on my life. You know what I did? I mully grew up for a little bit. I pouted just for a little bit. I kicked rocks for a, <laughs> for a second. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. They tell me to go eat some worms. <laughs> but you know what? I'm so glad that God humored me in my pity. And then you know what happened, Brother David? The Holy Ghost reminded me, they didn't call you, I did. They didn't save you. I did. You see, why is that important? Because at the end of the day, as much as I love you, I don't stand behind a pulpit. I don't sing just for you. I don't sing to entertain you. I don't preach to make you feel good. But because the call of God has been on my life before my very birth, and I have to do my due diligence because one day, whenever I do make it to the other side, I've got to give an account for everything that He ever gave me, every word that I ever spoke. Let me tell you something. The call of God on my life doesn't belong to me. I'm only borrowing it and when I'm done with it I got to turn it back in and I hope and pray that you realize that the call of God on your life will one day have to be handed back to him and I hope and pray that you don't find yourself like the one that went out and buried it but rather you added to it rather you sharpened it rather you elevated it whether you spread it around whether what was the investment in the with the return because at the end of the day it's not mine it's his Can, can, I, can I be the Lord for a moment? Listen, I, 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 don't, I don't know who needs to hear this. And I, I'm normally not this kind of preacher, but I, I feel the helper tonight. The, I, I don't know who you are, but I know there is somebody out there tonight, maybe a few of you, that you have just settled in the background because of the opinions of people regarding your history, regarding your, your origin, regarding of everything that you've come through. Nevertheless, you are here today. Can I, can I just encourage you for a moment? Last time I checked, there not going to be standing there on the great day of judgment holding your hand and taking your punishment. No, they're not going to receive your reward. You will stand before Almighty God all by yourself and you will give an account for you and you only. How dare you let the devil try his best to ensnare you in the lies of others, into the opinions of others. Why? Let me me tell you something. He didn't call you to obey the opinions of others. If he called you from the foundation of the world, he will strengthen you and empower you to do exactly what he told you to do. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed. Need not to be ashamed. 
In the Greek, they took one word and had to translate it into a phrase, need not be ashamed. When they could have easily said it like this, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that stands proud. That stands proud. You know, I like what church history tells us about the Apostle Paul and his execution. Because he stood proud of the gospel. Brother David, this is the same Paul that in Romans says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's something to do? No, 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 no. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it, it what? The gospel, the good news, the message of Jesus, the story of his birth, the story of his life, the story of his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his soon return. It is the power of God unto salvation to all who would believe. There's a reason to be proud of this. But you know, I've learned that a lot of people are not proud of the gospel because it causes them to deny themselves. And what world are we living in today? You know, last time I checked, love is a sacrifice. A relationship is a sacrifice. But the return that you get out of it is so much more than the sacrifice you given. I don't know how long I have on this earth, but I promise you this at the end of the day it is only but a small thing compared to what's waiting for me on the other side. Are y'all with me tonight? It is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. Here's what's interesting. Let me just stop here for a moment. Wow, we're doing good on time. I can slow down a bit. (laughs) The fact of the matter is this. Brother Chester, if you wouldn't mind, could you put 2 Timothy 2.15 back on the screen for me? I want to show you something. 2 Timothy 2.15. 2.15, chapter 2, verse 15. Thank you, sir. Close. 15. Yes, sir. Study to show thyself approved unto God, right? A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Leave that scripture up there for a moment. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Brother Wayne, that word approved unto God doesn't mean a stamp. It doesn't mean a check. That word approved up there tells a story all within itself. Acceptable. Study to make yourself acceptable unto God. You say, well, you're splitting hairs over this. I am. Because you need to understand the brevity of this scripture and the depth and the weight of this. Acceptable. Do you know where this comes from? Did you know that they didn't have Bank of America back in those days? First citizens wasn't a thing. They had no bank. They had no paper money. Their currency was made out of precious metals, right? Gold, silver, and copper, and tin. But (laughs) the fact of the matter is, is that it was precious to them. And you know what some people would do when they would make their money? Sister Betty. They would take the money and when they would go and buy something. Before they would buy something, they would shave off a little bit of the silver here off this coin. A little bit of silver off of this coin. A little bit of silver off this coin. Until they had enough to recast their own. And make more silver. Same thing with gold. Same thing with copper. But here's the deal. There were people that had studied. I mean, 
as crazy as it sounds, how much, how much does a penny weigh? Not much, right? You know, if you really want to feel the weight of a penny, you've got to have quite a few of them in your hands. But there were people that were so diligent you know, studying the money of that day that they could hold a simple copper coin in their hand and tell if any had been shaven off. You know what that's called? Skill. That's what he's saying. Study the Word of God so much that whenever everything sounds good, when everything looks good, when the rest of the congregation is shimmy and shaking because they're feeling it, study the Word of God so much that you can tell a difference in those that look like a sheep. They bleat like a sheep. While everybody else has trusted them as a sheep, you know the Word of God and you know the shepherd so good that when they smile, you can see wolves' teeth. You see, why is that important? Because this Word is so precious. Do you hear me? This Word is so precious. You remember the first song, the only song we sang tonight? What a lovely name. The Bible says there's what? No other name given under heaven by which men should be saved than that at the name of Jesus. You know, here's something that we don't talk about much. But uh, Brother David, did you know that there's a passage in the Old Testament that says that he has exalted his word above his name. Let that sink in for a moment. He has exalted his word above his life saving name. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be the shame. Are you ready for this? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Stop for a moment. And I hope you're okay with me sitting because I'm going to sit for a bit. You know, last time I checked, the Word of God is sharper, quicker than any two-edged sword, right? It pierces, it divides, and it separates. What sense does that make? We can rightly divide the Word of Truth. Can I, can, can I teach you a, a seminary phrase for a moment? Can I decline that phrase for you or translate it from the Greek to the English? Handling properly. The word of truth. Fun fact. I like to cook. Can't you tell? You better not. <laughs> Which means I know my way around the kitchen pretty good. And if my wife cooks the right thing, I can make my way around the kitchen with my eyes closed. <laughs> but you see, when it comes to... J j I'm about to make a, a connection here with you. When it comes to cooking, sometimes my favorite thing in the world is just a regular potato just sliced and fried. I can tell some of you grew up the way I did. <laughs> but let's face it, have you ever just taken a big old red skin potato and just dropped it in the skillet? That thing ain't going to do nothing but just burn before the whole thing ever cooks through. What do you have to do? Slice it. I'm accustomed to using a knife. A chef's knife at that. In fact, I'm not really a good marksman, but I can cut you quick. Here's the deal. I thought one day, I had so many potatoes I need to slice. I said, we got a brand new mandolin that I'm going to use. Anybody know what a mandolin is? That little thing that you... And I was so confident in myself because of my knife skills that I didn't use the guard. Some of you have been there, I see. Brother Sister Perry, I went, and I looked down. It got me so quick, I didn't feel it. But my potato bucket at that point was red like the Nile. You know why? Because I did not handle that instrument the way it was designed to be handled. 
This isn't something that a lot of people will tell you. So if you've never heard it, let me be the first to tell you. The Word of God is not something that the church defends. The Holy Spirit of God defends the Word. Even though we're not IPHC, uh, International Pentecostal Holiness Church, we're Church of God, I like the way the IPHC says it, that the Holy Spirit superintends His Word. He governs it. He guides it. Did you know that there have been people that have attempted to mishandle this precious word and almost every time they have fallen into sin because they are mishandling something so life-giving and precious. Normally I'm not a name dropper, but I'm going to drop one for you. Does the name Baker mean anything to you? Jim Baker? It's funny because normally when we say Jim Baker, we automatically think Tammy Faye. Now, you can disagree with me if you want to. I'm a big boy. I can handle it. But it is not right, and I do mean not right, to take the precious, holy, infallible, and inerrant Word of God and use it to manipulate people that have worked hard for their money, to manipulate them out of their hard-earned money, just so you could buy three houses and open up a Christian Disney World. What happened to him? You know. The one thing that he wanted and used the Scriptures to manipulate people to get is the one thing that landed him in prison. Satan, of all people, before he ever was named Satan, his name was Lucifer, light bearer. It's interesting, is it not, that the one thing he wanted, the glory, the pride to be worshipped, is ultimately the one thing that caused him to not only fall from heaven, but took others with him. And it's funny because Paul just told them that the reason I preach this gospel and I endure all of these things is because there are people out there that need to see me go through this. You see, because when we mishandle scripture, it doesn't just affect you and you alone. It affects everybody around you. And you know, I'm only 32, but I can still remember just from whenever I was younger, that there was a time in the church whenever men and women were so full of not only the Holy Ghost, but they were so full of God's Holy Word that if they, if they heard somebody preaching and they knew it wasn't right, immediately they were held accountable for what they said. Why? Because they cared. Not only about you, And those listening, but are you ready for this? They cared about the reputation of God. We have to care about the reputation of God. Oh, yes, we do. One of my favorite scriptures, and I'm trying my best to hurry us up along here because some of you have already checked out on me. The thing is, one of my favorite scriptures is, You shall make for yourself no graven images. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's one of the Ten Commandments. Well, there's a reason for that. The the God of Dagon, a fish god, looked like an ugly merman, was the God of lies. You know what they would do? They would make him out of stone that was found in the sea. And he was a fish god. Ashtaroth, or the Ashtrapoles, he was the God of the forest. Guess how he was represented? With a bare pine. You see, because whatever the God represented, the physical, tangible, touchable image had to have that in it. So why did he tell us, you shall make for yourself no graven images? Why? Because last time I checked, go back. Go back to whenever God created Adam and Eve. The Bible says that He spoke everything else into existence. Right? 
But they communed amongst themselves and said, Let us make man in our own image. Formed him out of the dust of the earth. And the Bible says that God breathed. Wait, 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 wait. Didn't we just read that? All scripture is breathed of God. He breathed the breath of life into him. And he became a living soul. You know what God can do? Love. You know what we can do? Love. God, He can hate. We can hate. I like what the scripture says. I will hate the things that God hates. God hates sin. He loves a sinner. God creates. Have you ever created something? I sure have. I've created songs. I've created recipes. I've I've, I've created trouble. <laughs> I've created solutions. God destroys. Have you ever destroyed anything? Oh, yes, I have. You see, because we who bear the image of God are direct reflections of His character and His ability. And when we mishandle the Word of God, we're, we are not just making ourselves look bad, but Paul says in Romans that we are bringing a reproach on the kingdom of God. Now, that, that's the nice King James way of saying it. Can I, can I tell you the, the 2023 way of saying it? People ain't getting saved because you Christians are acting like sinners. Is that possible? Yes. So much so that Paul writes, listen, I'm not going to finish the chapter tonight. So much so that Paul writes to Timothy, encouraging him, flee youthful lust. But he's saved. So, last time I checked, we got to be sanctified too. All right. Some of us still believe in that. I'm just letting you know. And then he reminds him of this one thing. Are you ready? Hardships will come. Ungodliness will prevail. Did you know that? He didn't sugarcoat it. He told him the truth. Just because you pastor a church and you were my disciple, Timothy, does not make you exempt from temptation, ungodliness, hardship, trouble, and sin. But here's what he does. In chapter 3, he talks all about the ungodliness of the age that is coming and is here. And then in the middle, bloop, in the middle of the chapter... I think Paul had an ADHD moment. Thank God for it. In the middle of talking about hardship, he uses the same phrase that we just referenced a moment ago. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable or useful for teaching, correction, rebuke. Why in the world would he remind him in the middle of talking about ungodliness that all scripture is God breathed because as a human who is tempted to take the path of least resistance we are not like those who do not have hope my goodness we are not like the sinner who is miserable in this life and in the life to come Absolutely not. The Paul says that we are the saints of God, the priests of God, the ones who have been called out of darkness and into the marvelous light, the ones who have shed the clothes of mourning and the clothes of darkness and have put on brand fresh and anew the garments of the day. We are the image of God. We are the inheritance of God. We are the portion of God. We are the promise of God. We are the first fruits of God. We are the first born with Him among the dead. We died with Him. We will live with Him. We will not taste death because...
because of him. So why did he tell him that all scripture is God breathed? Because at the end of the day, your feelings, they will fail you. Your friends will fail you. Your church will fail you. Your mentor will fail you. Your family will fail you. But let every man be a liar. But God is not a liar. But he is true and he is faithful and his word is steadfast and sure because you see and I promise I'm, I'm almost done just bear with me here can I tell you there was a time in my life and, and I mean, and I can, I can vouch for this. I've got friends of mine that can vouch for this. Sister, there, there was a time in my life when everything in my heart and in my mind had me convinced that there was no God. And I was a Christian. Everything in my life and everything in my experience had me convinced that I was not called of God to do anything. There was a time in my life when it seemed like the glory of God was pouring out on everybody in the church and here I was dry. Everybody else was in an oasis and I was in the middle of the desert. It was in that time of my life that I was tempted to quit. And if you lose respect for me after this, I don't care because I'm not here to gain your respect. I wanted to quit and I tried to quit and i done everything in my life to make myself look like an unbeliever. But just like Timothy, who had been in the scriptures since a young boy, every time I tried my best to sin... And get out from underneath the glory of God. Every time I tried my best to walk away. Good seed had fallen on good ground. And it kept me. Do you hear me? It kept me. Now listen, I'm Pentecostal from one end to the other. But there was a span of about five years I didn't shout. I didn't speak in tongues. I didn't do anything that other people classify Pentecostals as. But I had one thing that kept me sure in the middle of my darkest night, in the middle of my most harsh storm. I had one thing that kept me sane, one thing that kept me saved, and one thing that kept me on the right path. Because in His Word, He told me that He called me. And in His Word, He told me that He would be with me even unto the end. Because in His Word, He told me that even though weeping may endure for the night, joy would come in the morning. At the end of the day, my friends had walked away. Family had turned their back on me. But every night when I turned my head to go to sleep and the tears rolled from my eyes, just when I thought God was done with me, I would feel that sweet embrace that only the Holy Ghost can give His children. And He reminded me that I am His and He is mine and I am redeemed and I am washed in His blood and I am kept and His hand and His calling is still on me. Thank you, Jesus. Because if it had not been for him, and it had not been for godly grandparents who would read this to me, and it would make me mad because I'm tired, I want to go to sleep. They would read this thing to me. And you know what would happen? It would make me upset because I had to take time out of my busy schedule to sit down in my living room and listen to them read whenever I had friends and other things that were waiting on me. You know what they did? They offended me. They inconvenienced me. And let me tell you something. I'm so glad that they did. Because in times like today, I can tell you that whenever I thought there was nothing left in me, all of a sudden a seed from God's holy word that grandma and grandpa planted deep in me gets a little bit of water here and there from the tears that fall from my eyes and God gives the increase and all of a sudden I got fruit that I didn't even plant just like his word said that I would reap
Because somebody cared enough about me to sow good seed in me. Why? Here's why. I don't know what next year holds for me or you. And I'm sorry to sound political here, but I'm not talking about political at Washington. I'm talking about political in Cleveland for a moment. There are people that are my age that are holding credentials that should have never been given a set of credentials. And they are voting on things that they have no business voting on because they don't have enough gray hair on their head or enough birthdays under their belt to say what is good and what is acceptable. And guess what? That affects you and that affects me. I don't know where I will be five, ten years from now, but I promise you this. As long as there is breath in my body and as long as my nose is stuck in the holy pages of God's holy word, when the rest of the world and the rest of the church turn their back on the fundamentals of the faith, you know you have at least one here who will not turn, bend, or bow. Because it is unpopular. Did you know that the Bible says that the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is a stumbling block to the Jews. And it's an offense to the Greeks. Stumbling block and offense. Nothing pretty or patty cake nice comes from that. It is offensive. And in the society of council culture... People's reputations are being held against them because if they stand up for what's right, they may just be forgotten or abandoned. Good. Because I've learned from a few experiences already that whenever I'm all alone and in the midnight, that's whenever I find out a little bit more about my Jesus. Turn your backs. I don't care. I got one who said that he would never turn his back on me. Why? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel he gave me to preach. And he would not be ashamed of me. Why? Because I'm dead to myself. The words that I speak, they're not mine. They're his. It is my job. Why? Because he has been so good. He told him, he said, ungodliness, worldliness, lust, deceivers, false teachers, False prophets will, will, can I tell you what will means in Greek? Will. They will be among you. You will endure hardship. You will have family and friends at some point turn their back on you because of this holy word. It will happen. But remember, all scripture is breathed out of God. Last thing and I'm done. Have you ever seen somebody that really just killed over in front of you? I know it's kind of dark, but... Literally, have you ever seen somebody just drop dead in front of you? I have. I know Mercy Nurse over there has. <clears throat> you know what she does? I've told this story before. I'll give you the abbreviated version. I was preaching one night. Don't get any ideas. And a good, good church member, his name was Otis. I thought he was sneezing. One of those big sneezes. And whenever I, I never heard the ach- I looked, and he was sliding out of his seat. His color had already changed. He was not breathing. His heart was not pumping. She cracked ribs. And you know what she did? She had to breathe in. And then... (laughs) Breathe in to a man who could not breathe. Scripture is God breathed. Not just breathed, but breathed out. Sister Sheila, do you know what that implies? That implies that whenever God 
breathed out. He didn't just breathe out into the air. But it almost refers to he breathed into something that was ready to breathe in. As he breathed out, they breathed in. I was dead in my sins and trespasses. I had no life. I wouldn't have chosen God even if I could because I was dead. And He was everything that I didn't want. But you know what happened? I couldn't breathe in because dead men don't breathe. And as He breathed out my lungs and flesh, The Bible tells us that in the last days, there would not only be famine, but food and water and nourishment in the land. But the Bible tells us that there would be famine of the word. And can I tell you this? There are people out there that are nasty. They are mean. They are ungodly. Those of you that have been to the abortion clinic, you've seen the evidence of some of that. But can can we do the Christian thing for a moment? Look past your own offense for a second. Look past your own offense for a second. And what you're seeing, you're seeing dead men and dead women that are just trying to live. But they can't because it's simple. Dead people do not live. Whenever Mr. Otis got that first breath doing CPR, it was, he wasn't talking, Brittany was working on him. He wasn't even conscious of what was happening. But Brother David, whenever he got that first breath, his color began to change. He lived a week after that and was allowed to make everything right with his family that had been made wrong. All because somebody, hear me, hurt him. Because somebody cracked his, because somebody inflicted pain. Somebody caused bruising. Because it was necessary. So that he, so that he may live. I know I've gone way over my time. But I I want, thank you Jesus. I want to leave you with the words of A.W. Tozer. Good godly man. I want you to think about that visual I just gave you. Pain, bruising, just so that you may live because it was beneficial. When I, Brother David, when I was a young man, younger man, that passage that I read from Tozer never made sense to me. But at just 32, I've had enough hurt and enough heartache in my life that it finally made sense. Before God can truly use a man or a woman, he must first hurt him deeply. He said that he would give you new wine and oil for your wounds. I've never seen wine and oil solid. It must first be crushed. There are times in my life, there are times in my life I've asked God, why must I endure this? 
You know, God is a good keeper. He keeps good store in good record. The oil and the wine that was pressed from me flowed into the wounds of somebody who was hurt. You say, why Why in the world would God hurt you just to help somebody else? You see, that's the thing. If you're asking that question, you're already asking the wrong one. He said that if you seek to keep your life, you'll lose it. But if you give your life freely, it'll be given back to you. They could literally buy and sell and trade with wine and oil because it was currency. Brother David, he told us that we're the salt of the earth. Guess what salt is? It was a form of money. The word of God is sure. God breathed. He keeps his word. Though ungodliness and tribulation come your way, stand firm in the holy word because he promised us. He promised us that every tear we shed, He keeps a record of. Every heartache that we endure, He never wastes it, He uses it. Every harsh word we get, He keeps score. And last time I checked, there's a reason He says, do not repay evil for evil. He says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. You are too precious in His sight. My glory to God. You are too precious in His sight to waste what He has given you on repaying evil for evil. He, however, is the righteous one who will repay in the end. Until then, stand on His word because you just might find it's the only thing that keeps you righteous, holy. And if I can go old school for a moment, on your way to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Father, God, the one that's dealing with depression right now, I bind it. Not of my own accord. I'm nothing. But Lord, because of your holy word that has been breathed out of your nostrils and given to your people, I bind depression on the saint of God right now. Because you said that we could and your word is sure. You said that you could give us joy in our harsh times. Lord, the saint that is sick in their body, I plead the blood of Jesus over them. You took stripes for their healing. Lord, to the saint that cries himself asleep tonight, praying for the salvation of their family. Lord, they're yours. God, they, they gave them to you. And you'll be the one to bring them home. Even whenever our attempts and our exhausts fail, you have not run out of trials. You have not run out of tricks. God, you have not run out of things needed. Lord, dare I say, you have not even run out of pain that is needed so that a dead man can live. God, I pray that your people tonight would walk in the pages of Holy Scripture until your face is as plain as day to them. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Don't forget Sunday morning, uh, we're having our Family and Friends Day. Continue to pray for Brother Jesse and his family and, and the loss of his dad. And continue to pray for Sister Carson and her brand new baby girl. God bless you all. You're dismissed.